topics we'd like to hear about, what kinds of speakers we'd like to invite in. And of course, all of our speakers are chamber members and they're sharing information that is important for uh, uh, our chamber members. So today we're, we've got Wade Ashbrenner. He sits on the Government Affairs Committee with me. And I'm so excited to have him because he is actually, I, I, I didn't know, but he is actually really involved with this issue of digital divide, which was something that we brought up at our last meeting and something we really wanted to know more about, hear more about how this is being addressed. So I'll hand it over now to Wade to speak on the digital divide. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Wade Ashbrenner, Altus Schools. Uh, we transform lives through our seven charter schools here in Southern California. We have approximately uh, a little over 4,000 students currently enrolled with us in an independent study program. Uh, we have over 45 resource centers uh, spread throughout uh, San Diego, Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. So uh, as far as distance learning goes, um, it, all, the, all the data and facts I share with you today have an expiration date of about 45 minutes because everything's about subject to change depending on the school district and uh, the COVID conditions that we're currently in. But um, again, Teresa, thank you uh, for letting me speak today. And uh, distance learning and the digital divide, um, it's really transitioned from a shortage of devices while that's still a component of uh, the digital divide it's not the driving force anymore there's approximately half a million school-aged children in san diego county um, approximately a hundred thousand of those students needed some type of device or connectivity um, and then uh, the latest statistics from uh, the san diego county office of ed is about 100,000 uh, students are still under-resourced. And that's really where the digital divide uh, and equity for distance learning comes in. So either uh, they have a computer uh, or some type of device, but it's really not sufficient to have uh, any type of robust distance learning or their connectivity is not at a level that is stable enough to do these types of Zoom calls. Uh, at length that they need to do. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, there is a task force um, working on that from a charitable giving side. So each of the districts within San Diego County and the San Diego County Office of Ed is doing a tremendous job of spearheading it on, on, the, on the district and public school side of it. But then there's also this uh, distance learning task force that is looking at how we can fund some of the other issues that affect equity in distance learning. So um, uh, right now it's really about um, having the devices and the connectivity that's been the sole focus of the school districts as they've uh, embarked on this distance learning. And so if you're not directly involved, you probably know somebody who's directly involved or uh, you've read about it in the paper. So a lot of Google Chromebooks going out to students and families. But uh, one of the main problems with that is um, on, the, uh, on the user end. So you have connectivity, you have a Chromebook that's been issued to you by your school district, but uh, you're maybe one of the 20% of families that don't speak English as your primary language. How do you get help with any of the uh, technology as far as how, how do you learn how to Zoom if you don't Zoom? If your family doesn't have an email address that uh, you actually use. So there's all these other issues on the user side of things that um, really impact the equity of education that uh, predominantly students that are low socioeconomic or students of color have to grapple with. And so that's really what the task force is working on now. So. When you hear the term digital divide, I know um, most people think about the access to devices, but it's really the access to those other things, those other support mechanisms. Um, one of the big things is, is imagine you're a second grader and your students who are more well off, they have a dedicated desk, they have a mouse, they have a dedicated printer. Well, if you're a family that has just been issued a uh, Chromebook, you probably just have the Chromebook, 
you have no idea how to use that Chromebook efficiently to access anything. And it's much harder to do your lessons just without that mouse. So just something as simple that most of us take for granted is a mouse uh, to do our schoolwork with and, and it is something that a lot of families still don't have. So that's really um, what we're talking about is shifting the focus away from the device and then having communities come together. And that's one of the great things about the chamber is really looking at people like this group to come up with some innovative solutions and move away from really thinking beyond the individual hotspots for these families that lack connectivity and really talk about some of the, the innovative stuff that cities can do as far as some public mesh networks that can be offered. I know um, a lot of cities have gone to the digital traffic cameras and there is the technology that allows for those to, uh, to be programmed with the ability to have mesh networks so that students can get reliable internet. And then really uh, taking into account the regional differences, just even with, within a county like San Diego. Um, Predominantly, most of the families affected by this are going to be below Interstate 8 down in the South County. That's where the data shows that most of the families who lack stable internet um, reside. And so uh, a solution that works in Carlsbad or San Marcos or Encinitas um, might not be the solution that takes place um, down in City Heights or uh, down in the North Park area. So it's really uh, having a regionalized approach, but targeted solutions. So um, that's one of the focuses that we have with the task force is um, how can we partner with businesses and technology experts uh, to find those targeted solutions for communities. Um, and so um, that's, that's the primary number one uh, focus of our distance learning task force. And then um, really, providing the type of outreach to families and the support, the help desk support, I guess would be the proper term is what, what really the districts, um, and there's districts part of this task force and even they weren't really prepared uh, or understood the need to have tech support for their families and students just on how to use some of this technology and how to access it. So, um, uh, as voices in the community and tech, tech experts, I would uh, definitely encourage you to, to share with your local school district any creative ideas you have for that. Um, I know the Cajon Valley uh, School District has really been on the forefront of providing that and they're actually um, hiring a person that's going to be um, their tech support person for just the families during this distance learning period and then you layer on top of that the need for multiple languages at this help desk so um, again it's all about circling back to that that equity issue of how do we get not only devices but how do we get the support that families need um, to access the technology once we have it in their hands so um, creating uh, Again, targeted community support with language support. And again, the professional development on the parent side, um, because uh, as this group knows, there's a lot of uh, daily interaction that you know just from being experienced tech users that you're gonna have, have to help with young children who are trying to navigate distance learning now that some families just don't have that expertise residing within uh, their home. And so those parents, uh, it's another stressor during the COVID times of, I already know my child needs support, but I have no idea how to, to provide that support or where to turn for that support. So um, there are some creative partnerships um, being built down in the city of San Diego, and hopefully we'll be able to be a kind of a, a, a hub and spoke type model to where they can reach to all the different areas of the county where they can provide a centralized website where families can kind of use just a very uh, simplistic AI that will let them uh, type in some questions and it'll send them to the right uh, either YouTube video or uh, call center where they can get some of that support that they need. But um, the parent support and uh, development for their tech usage is something that's really needed in San Diego to provide equitable uh, distance learning. And so that really falls under the digital literacy of parents. And then um, uh, 
the final area that we're really tackling with uh, equitable distance learning is the ability for uh, quality childcare. Uh, because these, uh, uh, quite honestly, the families most affected uh, by COVID and the inequities in distance learning are the families that either are essential workers or work the type of jobs that they can't work from home. And so um, they're having a tremendous uh, amount of stress trying to find childcare. So it, it, it's really those three components that fall into that digital divide of uh, the families that can provide those three things, their child is not going to have the learning loss. And some of the early studies uh, done by the educational researchers is showing that students of color are probably going to suffer at least one year of learning loss at a minimum eight to nine months of learning loss just from the COVID pandemic. And then that uh, can only be exacerbated the longer uh, schools have to uh, stay in this distance learning mode. So um, as it pertains to, to this group, it's really uh, about finding creative solutions. Um, for the most part, the districts themselves have been able to come up with the devices and the funding to purchase those uh, uh, devices and have been able to disseminate them. I know um, I live in the San Marcos School District and they've been able to um, as far as their data shows, get the devices to every student in the district. But again, then those other three things come into play. How well uh, is the device uh, being able to be manipulated by the student and the family? How reliable is their internet connection? And, and then what kind of support do they have in those uh, families to provide uh, just simply an opportunity for the parent to uh, uh, have an opportunity to perform those jobs? So I don't uh, know what else you'd like me to discuss. Um, it, it is a need. It, it, the districts, um, whether they're charter schools, private schools, or traditional public schools, they need support from the tech community because uh, they're doing this for the first time. They are uh, preparing as best as they can, but there's going to be unforeseen uh, technology potholes out there for these districts. And I think primarily what we're seeing uh, at the distance learning task force is the need for those type of health help desk situations or uh, creative solutions where families can go online and kind of uh, self-diagnose what they need and where they can go to get the help they need. So with that, thank I'll kind of throw so it back much. to you, Teresa. Yeah, thank you so much, Wade. Uh, I I really appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise and information with us. We always open it up for Q&A and I know that I gave you a heads up about that so uh, we can expect some questions from the group. Uh, do you have questions? Any of our TAC members have questions for our speaker? I have lots of questions and thoughts and because I have three children. I have three boys, nine and under. It's a lot of testosterone in the house and a lot of <laughs> fart jokes, right? But I'm a tech person. Like tech, we were a remote agency. We could have we could have been working anywhere and anywhere, you know, at any point in time. So when the pandemic hit, like operations wise, we didn't have to change. But that support was a killer for businesses. We went from like doing a bunch of sales, normal things, to like no sales and support. How do I set up Zoom? How do I do this? How do I do that, do that right? So I've got three kids that are total tech nerds. My nine-year-old knows how to like debug his own computer, set up things, troubleshoot on his own, right? Thankful he's got a nerd mom and we're doing online learning because that is preferential and I know that they'll do well. I also have a lot of computers and devices in my house. However, when we started school, because we have a different custody arrangement, which is why we chose online school for my two youngest, because they have to go five hours away. I asked the online learning coordinator if the school would be providing computers to students who would, didn't, you know, who didn't have access to them, who wanted to have online learning as an option. And the answer was no. And so immediately, you know, that was a big concern of mine. What are districts doing for kids that want the option of online learning or who maybe would be better. I have an autistic child. Online learning was always on the table well before he started school 
before there was any pandemic, before he entered kindergarten, to see if that was going to be an area where he would do better, um, just because of the social aspect and certain anxieties and things of that nature. So that's one of my questions for you, Wade, is what, how are districts handling the distribution of those machines? Um, are there districts that are coming up short? And uh, you know, how do they end up uh, uh, tackling that? That's my, my first question. So each district, um, as you know, here in California, the, the governor said every district has to start online um, or at least remotely, I, you know, and that, that's another equity issue is people use remote or distance learning and it can mean many different things to each person. But as far as the instruction being delivered via uh, the computer, um, each district is kind of tasked with designing that themselves. And that's where uh, here in San Diego, the County Office of Ed is kind of taking the leadership on that. But as far as the distribution of individual devices, I've seen it across the board. So speaking from my own experience here in San Marcos, they took it upon themselves that every, they were gonna distrib distribute Chromebooks like they distribute textbooks. So each family was required to show up before school started and whether you had sufficient technology or not, you were gonna get a Chromebook. And that was just a decision the district made so that every student in the district would have at least a Chromebook now, other districts have done more of a survey and fill in the needs approach based on their funding model. And so they've surveyed families and said, do you need a device? And if you don't, then you're not getting one. So um, each district is taking that different approach. But um, as far as um, any mandate, as far as uh, devices to each student, there isn't that right now. It's just the districts are up and the charters are up to surveying their parents and finding out that what kind of connectivity they have. Okay, and the second question I have to that, talking you know, about those inequities is, you, know, you said you'd like the focus not to be so much on devices. And I think about like homeschool, like homeschool, like my husband was homeschooled, you know, that was many, many years ago, but there, there, were, there were no Zoom meetings. There was not this technology emphasis and they were able to do that successfully. Where is the district's focus in terms of maybe potentially having that balance or looking at, well, you know, we didn't have all this technology before and we were doing education. How effective was that? You know, is that part of the model? Is everything fully online or are, are some groups approaching more of like a homeschool style approach with in addition to, you know, some other means because we have technology? What are your thoughts and what's kind of happening with that? Well, what I'm seeing is really uh, a myriad of approaches. <clears throat> so there's the, what I would say the hybrid approach would be some distance learning, some in-person learning, and then some of that um, more of a homeschool approach with the technology being used more as a tool uh, and then doing a lot of support of the parent as the teacher resource in, in the home. So. With the task force, we're really looking at that as how do we provide those professional development opportunities to the families that want to take that approach where they want to serve as, as kind of the homeschool teacher and then having the ability through the use of technology to get additional expertise and support, uh, but not make technology the primary driver of instruction. So um, it's, as I said earlier in my introduction, it's, it's every day, different approaches are being developed and the larger the school district probably the more cookie cutter the approach just because of the sheer size of uh, the number of kids they have to deal with and that's one of the things I would say is a tremendous advantage for some of the charter schools and private schools is that um, because they're functioning with some smaller numbers they can do more targeted approaches and really listen to their parents and offer that personalized education um, to fit what the parent and the student feel is really the need. And I think one of the uh, positives that can come out of this uh, COVID situation on the educational front is it's really pushing districts to innovate and look at different ways of serving their students and realizing that um, students, regardless of color or country of origin or primary first language, uh, all need something different. And how do we provide the supports 
so that they can all uh, maximize their potential and the intelligence that's this inherent in each and every child. So um, I think technology can be a tremendous tool. It's not gonna be the solution. Um, we're still gonna need great teachers who engage kids. Um, learning is a very personalized uh, uh, environment. Um, without that engagement, it doesn't matter if you have the best technology, uh, students aren't going to learn. They need that uh, tremendous engagement and usually that comes in the form of some type of other adult um, that's helping them with the content. So um, um, that's what I would say on that as far as the instructional delivery. Thank you, Wade. Other questions? Josh, you're on mute. Uh, I've got a quick question. Great presentation, Wade. I appreciate the insight. I'm curious if uh, the panel has been looking at any uh, type of pilot programs, either nationally or internationally, that have been successfully deployed in the last, you know, two to three years with similar like criteria. So, you, where you may have a, a gap in terms of. Uh, ability for students to attend a physical location and you maintain the curriculum standards of previous uh, you know, administration and guidance, governmental guidance. Are there pilot programs out there that exist that? Um, at this point, I haven't, I, I've, I've been in discussions where that's been discussed and there are some people that are looking to do that. And again, I would, I would assume it was probably going to come out of the charter school community because they have more flexibility uh, with trying those. And that's really what charter schools were designed for, but taking the best programs. Um, I think uh, to your point, we need to take a global view of, of what are some programs uh, out there in the rest of the world that maybe have shown some results and have the data to back it up so that we're not trying to re reinvent the wheel, uh, you know, here in the United States. Um, but it's really going to be, uh, it's good. It's really going to be up to the, like anything in technology, there's going to be some fearless entrepreneurs that are going to take the leap and families that are willing to follow them when they take that leap. And so, um, uh, hopefully we will see that um, there's uh, not as far as from a school have I seen that I've seen that more on the um, tech side of things on um, people on the distance learning for want uh, task force want to put together some type of virtual uh, meeting space where families that share that similar type of thing uh, can come together, but you need the data and the research behind it to, to guide it to your point. And so um, that's something I can definitely bring up because there are some some people on the distance learning task force uh, from uh, from the Obama administration and from USD that are involved in research. And so that could be uh, at least spark some conversation there. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Other questions? I have another question. Go for it. Is anybody looking at drive-in or style learning or jumbotron? I'm just thinking, you know, they want to do social distancing. We've got like large stadiums with multi-million dollar media and so forth. And so maybe that potentially can facilitate some of that. You know, what kind of like creative or innovative outdoor situations is anybody considering? I mean, we look at space and it just seems like when the pandemic hit because everybody's scrambling and running, right, to try to get something in place that, you know, sometimes creativity is stifled and innovation is stifled and things aren't as thought out because everybody's rushing because everybody's putting pressure on instead of everybody really taking the time, you know, to put, you know, together a, maybe a more collaborative approach or more creative approach. But I see, you know, we look at like, oh, you either have to be at school or you have to be at home. When there are several other places where effective learning can take place outdoors. Even, I mean, think about all the field trips, you know, that kids normally would go on and, you know, to do things, community gardens, state parks, you know, those different types of things. Are districts even looking at those as potential options for doing more dynamic learning, like different spaces? Like where are these 
other spaces where learning may be able to take place, especially facilities that aren't in use or for fields that aren't in use for a lot of sports that have now been canceled and so forth? So um, I wouldn't say that I know a vast amount about that. I know that in San Diego, Councilman uh, Chris Kate has brought that forward, that very idea that San Diego Unified should be using, number one, the great weather we have here in the San Diego region, and number two, the, the many parks and outdoor areas that would be ideal settings. I would suspect um, we will see some of that as uh, schools get back in session, but um, quite honestly, I think for the most part, the districts have just been trying to tread water and do mm -hmm. the professional development for the teachers to be able to even be proficient at providing distance learning. And so their, their focus obviously one on students and getting families devices and connectivity, and then two on their teachers in getting the professional development skills to deliver those courses. And then um, we'll see some of the innovation. I think once the teachers are back and feel comfortable with the technology tools that they are tasked with using in delivering some of that content uh, in uh, outdoor settings. I think that's a tremendous idea. I think it's something that really can change the way we view what is school. And then the final part would just be a, a personal comment uh, to your point is I think um, there's been this tremendous pressure to return to normal and returning to normal as we've seen now, you, we're not gonna return to normal. We're not gonna return to uh, 2019 school the way it looked back then mm -hmm. uh, anytime in the foreseeable future. And so I think that's where the creativity needs to now come into play is how can how can schools look truly like 21st learning centers? Uh, can, they, can they not look like the industrial revolution, uh, five rows of seven kids sitting there quietly and raising their hands and how can we get them into these type of innovation centers where um, the vast majority of people are gonna work in the future, creative places where each buddy, uh, everybody's perspective can be taken into account and they can find those innovative solutions. And some of it'll come, I think, from the kids themselves. They'll find out uh, where they learn best. And then I think there's uh, a, a willingness by administrations and superintendents to listen to their families like no time in recent memory as far as parents have tremendous power right now. Um, with their school boards and their superintendents and their school board elections coming up in November. And not to sound like an a, a advocacy wonk, but it's really important to find uh, those people that are running for school board seats that really look to um, seek to find innovative solutions right now. Thank awesome. you. And I think the chamber is going to be hosting a candidate forum for all the people running. Uh, in September, um, and that includes two S Carlsbad Unified School Board seats, I believe. Uh, Josh, did you have a question? Yeah, just uh, kind of along those same uh, thought patterns that you were talking about, Wade. Has the task force identified any critical failure points? I mean, in my experience, volunteering with elementary school and middle school, the biggest hiccup that I would see is the teachers not being able to adapt to the technology. I mean, these are teachers, some of them are, you know, 20, 30 years into their career that were having trouble turning on a projector. And now we're asking them to teach remote classes. Have you guys identified like a couple critical failure points similar to that, that are like stop gaps? Well, that's definitely why, uh... Uh, along with parent uh, professional development and digital literacy, that's been a key point is filling in the needs where school districts can't provide some of that because they maybe won't have the funding in a timely fashion, or they just haven't, they're blind to that need with their teaching staff. And some, some uh, schools and some districts just have a much better professional development program. So their teachers are probably more readily able to access some of that. But that, that's definitely one of the items on our um, solutions list with the task force is that not only do we have to have parents uh, have the ability for uh, professional development, but we really got to find out where those gaps are and um, be able to fill in for the teachers. 
Um, and some of it for the teachers too is just, uh, it's tremendously stressful that they're 20 years into their profession and now they're basically starting over. Um, and so how much reluctance will there be for them to engage in using the technology in a way that will engage their students? And the other thing that has shown itself, um, and this is uh, from some of the districts is, if a teacher was struggling with uh, student engagement in the face-to-face -face mode, uh, distance learning and Zoom really uh, exposes that lack of ability to engage students. And again, there'll be need for tremendous professional development on that. So it, 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 uh, the, the task force is aware of it. Um, and now it's just finding a way to get the data so that we can do the targeted uh, professional development that's needed. And so there is some exploration of, you know, countywide. That's why it's important for San Diego County Office of Ed to really uh, be a driver of this of where they can be a repository of some of those professional development um, opportunities for teachers. But again, um, how do you get those teachers who are reluctant learners to go to those type of training? So again, it's good to take creative solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I saw that Alex posted a question. It was the same one that I thought is how can, how can we help? What can we do as chamber members and this committee? Like how can we get involved? What can we do to help in this, in this area? Well, I think as tech experts um, and, and or a, a, at least very uh, proficient with technology and what's going on there is, is talking to your local district or your local charter school or your local private school, wherever you feel comfortable, uh, maybe even at the, at the school board level in, and just posing some of the questions you know from operationalizing businesses, what are some of the technology pitfalls that maybe school districts aren't seeing? Um, and I think, you know, as Cajon Valley pointed out, is really that help desk that they didn't even really think about because they're so worried about the students and devices and so worried about professional development of the teachers. Uh, what happens once this ball's in motion and people have just some simple questions on how to access stuff. And so I think that's probably from what I've seen on the task force, that's probably going to be needed throughout the county is some type of help desk situation or the development of that kind of uh, AI chat fe feature where families can go on and find the answers themselves if they feel proficient. But uh, obviously right now is about uh, communication and collaboration and then, um, if you're an expert uh, providing it, providing the expertise to people, and you may have to knock on their door two or three times, um, especially as we head back to school. Wade, so you're saying right now they don't have like a help desk that they can access for assistance. Is that correct? It's going to vary depending on the school district. Um, I don't know that San Diego Unified, everybody has a, like a chief technology officer, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's not a help desk person. That's not a person, that's not a number they're gonna publish and say, hey, um, I, couldn't, I could log on to my Google Classroom, but I have no idea how to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, obviously a teacher's only gonna be as proficient as they've been able to um, train themselves, so to speak. And so is there, you know, a time might not happen during school hours. Can these families call? Maybe a family's decided to make the investment in, hey, we're buying a um, printer and we've never had a printer in our house before. And we're not even sure what the first step is. And so maybe there's a language barrier there. So, I, and again, this is just some of the things I'm supposing may happen out there as families realize that that this distance learning is going to stay here for uh, at least probably through the end of the year in some places. Okay. Let me so... interject. My... Go, Go ahead, ahead John. Alex. Let me interject myself with experience from, let's see, 30 some years ago when you guys were in diapers. Um, I uh, was just began running a newspaper in DC on the technology business around Washington and a new school opened up. Uh, called Buzz Aldrin Elementary School, it named after Buzz the, the uh, astronaut. By the way, I got to meet him several times. And so we were involved in helping them set up their newspaper and our newsletter and so forth. And I got to talk to a lot of the teachers because that school was inter wired for internet with ethernet since about 1987 or eight. And uh, 
the um, uh, and the teachers all had their own laptops or whatever they had in those days, and the students got to use the computers in the school. Well, some of the students had computers at home. Their parents worked for the government. They had computers. They understood it. And the biggest concern that was there was that the teachers did not think like the students when it came to handling computers. To the students, were, was always there. The internet was always there. And the teachers had to go back, like I did, to what I learned in grade school and so forth about how to put things down on paper and how to progress it forward. And I think you brought up a great point about the teacher's reluctance to start a new career in learning distance learning where they've done everything in the classroom. And I think this is a big problem that uh, I have no idea how to attack, but it's something that has to be dealt with. Yeah. I've heard this and I, I totally agree with you. This is, this is the change management. This is the pivoting and adapting and being flexible that, that so many institutions lack. And a lot of government institutions are well known for this. That's why there's that bureaucratic um, caricature that we all think of. They, they just don't know how to change. Let me give you a little interesting thing. We were, I was there one day visiting with the fourth graders and they had them all in a pod sitting there in front. And so I was talking to them about how at the newspaper, we're using the same computers that they're using there and uh, have the printing and everything. And this one little girl raises her hand and she says, do you have one of those machines where you push the button and the letter comes right out on the paper? To her, the typewriter was novel where you didn't have to go through everything and go through the printer. And we all erupted with laughter, but it was true. You know, she had already moved past. The typewriter was long gone and these teachers were still typing things out. So it's uh, there is a there is a there is certainly a generation gap. Yes, and and I do agree with you, Wade, that we should be contacting our school districts. We should be asking questions. We should be prompting, pushing, prodding them to do better, to do more, and to understand what parents really need. And when it comes to that candidate forum that I mentioned for the school board members, these are questions that you guys can ask. You can attend and ask these questions. What are you doing to pivot? How are you changing? Because as small business owners, most of us are, I think all of us here are, uh, we know how to do that. We have to do that. It's our livelihood, but they don't. They don't always know how, and it's really hard to change a big organization and move it. And all the little people in there, uh, kind of like a big Titanic ship, you know, they're, they're fighting the change. They don't like it and they've got tenure or they, you know, they've got, they've got protections for their job and they just don't see why they have to do it. So the best ones will, you know, a lot of good ones will, but you've got some holdouts and it really takes everybody moving together to make that change and to be a good district. Small ones have a better, better um, chance of success as Wade said. So I, I so really, this is great. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think cross-generation collaboration, as Teresa knows, I'm very much into it. So just remember that when hacking first started in security, you know, there were a lot of young hackers that were like arrested, thrown in prison and jail, and there's some pretty sad stories there. But a few of these were actually hired by the government to teach them what was going on with hacking. And I think a model very much like that would be very useful at a government level to go out and find younger people that truly understand the technology because they were, you know, they basically were born with a cell phone in their hand and, um, and find, those, find those younger people that actually can clearly communicate and educate an older generation and make it fun. Because if it's not fun, people generally aren't going to really uh, adopt it, I think. Just my thoughts there. John, thank you for mentioning that because uh, uh, right before you had clicked in, my thought was, and also a question for Wade was, do you feel that you have access to the expertise that you need to roll out a plan? I mean, this is one of the problems that government has with regulating these big tech industries is because they have no idea who it works. They will most likely never be able to regulate or properly handle companies like Facebook, Twitter, because the, if, if you watched, you know, whether you're a fan of Mark Zuckerberg or not, it was really pretty funny to watch some of these senators ask these questions to him, you know, like you're, you know, somebody who did not grow up in that technology. And they're like, if I do this, will this happen? And he's looking like, 
I can tell he's trying to be serious and professional and he's not trying to be condescending, but he's like, you know, that's not, not how this works. Right. Or and that's so, not, that's <laughs> not our app, sir. Yeah. It's like, that's no, that's a completely yeah. different company. And it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, you have those grandparents, like my mom is asking my nine-year-old how to fix something on her phone. She doesn't know. Right. And so, as a, as a district, when somebody says, hey, let's roll out an online learning plan, do you feel that you had access to, you know, people who are going to be like, hey, if you're going to implement online learning, because by the way, we're a tech company and we do online learning and online training with our staff or whatever, do you feel like you had access to that to roll out an effective plan or, and do you currently have access to that? Because some of the issues that you're mentioning as a tech person, I'm going, oh, well, if I need a help desk support, you know, I would just start calling up Zendesk and Fresh Chat and Fresh Desk. I know they've got free plans. I'd set up separate support ticket portals for each of those. I would allow mobile access. I know what video software kids can make video calls. It would be mobile. And I would just throw a bunch of, you know, junk on the table and be like, hey, there's, here's 20, 20 options that will work in terms of if somebody can get to a device, maybe not even necessarily internet able device, here are the different ways that people could connect, right? So Wade, do you feel that you have access to that and the people that you work with have access to that to roll out these types of initiatives? Did you have that to start and do you have that now currently? So Great question. So speaking specifically about Alta schools and as a charter school, uh, we were fortunate, uh, fortunate probably back in 2013, we ran into uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Horn and he worked with Clayton Christensen on disruptive uh, education, disruptive classroom back then. Um, they, the prequel to that was a business book about disruptive innovation. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. And we had a long talk with uh, Michael back in 2013, and he kind of became our uh, North Star as far as an organization and what we needed to start moving to. So as an organization, uh, yes, we felt very prepared and we've been, we, we were fortunate that we've been working on this for seven years. And so when COVID hit in March, it was uh, part of the plan to pivot. Uh, we were an independent study program already. Our teachers had already went through leading edge certification on how to teach online that had just become part of our business, uh, the way we did business, the way we hired everything. But that being said, uh, the educational field is a wide spectrum and it goes from huge monolithic bureaucracies like LA Unified, um, and some of the larger school districts that aren't going to be able to pivot and they maybe have one or two voices that have access to that and, and sometimes they get drowned out by competing uh, constituencies. So um, I, to your point, um, no, I would say um, in my own opinion, the vast majority are not or don't know where to seek that advice. Um, and that's why the importance of public uh, private collaboration and partnerships is vitally important in education, especially in the 21st century. Um, as uh, wherever you lie on the political spectrum, you can't look for governments and bureaucracies to solve all your problems. Um, you got to find innovative thinkers and bring them to the table. And, and obviously, schools aren't going away, and school districts aren't going away, and teachers' unions aren't going away. But they're part. They're, they have to be part of the solution. But they have to be part part of a solution that brings more people to the table. And that's one of the things I think at, at this point in, uh, in our history is really, uh, there's the willingness to do that. Uh, one, the pandemic has forced us to look at things in a different way um, and take different perspectives into account. So um, that's what I encourage this group to do is to reach out to those, uh, whether it's elected officials or school board people and really find out and, and ask the tough questions. It's not, it's not uh, out of line to ask, you know, what are you doing for help desk? Or what are you doing for, for tickets when a teacher's laptop breaks down? Or what happens when a kid's, to your point right there, it just made me think, what happens when a family's Chromebook uh, has a tech issue? What do, what do they do? they're probably going to ask their teacher and their teacher's not equipped to, to buy technical extra expertise on that level. So you're seeing all those things that as uh, people who run uh, tech companies or technology based uh, rich companies, uh, you know, what's going to happen, you know, some of the stumbling blocks that are out there as school districts and as, as charter schools, 
Um, some of these institutions are walking down this uh, road for the first time. And so they're gonna be blindsided by some of this stuff. Um, and then you have, uh, as far as education's looked at, you're looking at probably deferrals by the state as far as their funding goes. And so they're gonna be strapped uh, financially just uh, like the rest of the economy at some point because that, um, that funding stream, while the dollars are there, they're not sending them at the same time as they traditionally have. So um, great, great point that you brought up. Uh, the Thank access you. to the expertise is something that organizations need to seek out. Okay. Thank you so much, Wade. I know we have many more questions for you. I hope we can keep you engaged with this committee in the future sure. because you have a lot to offer. And, and uh, I know that some people are having to drop off already. We're, uh, yeah, I need to jump on another call too, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it completely. So thank you so much for being here and for sharing so much great information with us. We really appreciated it. And uh, we, we will be talking about uh, a lot more of these kind of distance, uh, not just distance learning, but distance working and similar um, kind of strategies and new ways of doing things because of COVID, we know that this is going to last, as you said, through the rest of the year for, for distance learning and uh, probably much longer until we have some other mechanisms in place, prevention and, uh, and some kinds of uh, cure or other treatments for COVID. So we're, we're still figuring things out and we need to, we need to adapt. And we, if we haven't done it yet, we need to do it now <laughs> because this is, this is our current situation. So thank you for being here. All right, thank uh, and you very you much. Feel free, feel free to drop off. I, I know we, you have another call. Uh, all, we're just gonna wrap up with a couple more things. Um, we typically so, talk, go ahead. I just wanted to bring, the next is the goals, 2021 goals. And this is from last, um, month kind of as a mind jogger to keep us flowing in the right direction is what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Because this keeps dropping uh, to, to the next month, to the next month, we keep pushing it back.